chapter thirty four of order number eleven this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org order number eleven by caroline abbott stanley chapter thirty four the certificate for answer mammy wet a towel and laid it on beverly's hot forehead that child's out of his haid she remarked under her breath to uncle reuben beverly tore the towel off and threw it from him i am not out of my head i tell you he said you treat me as if i were a child mammy lois chandler is my wife my wife we were married last winter before i went south it's true i tell you his vehemence was carrying conviction to their minds but mammy would not accept it meekly her whole soul rose in rebellion at this ignoble alliance for a trevilian in god's name marse beverly what did you do it fur mammy i loved her i felt afraid i might not get back and i could not go away without feeling that she would have the protection of my name if anything happened to me i meant it right god knows i meant it right but i'm afraid i did wrong go and get her he cried feverishly bring her to me poor child homeless and fatherless and oh mammy take her to your heart she needs you go long said mammy to uncle reuben the tears rolling down her cheeks bring all her traps tell her mammy's got a place for her de lord knows whar it'll be she added to herself when the old man was gone and beverly quieted down mammy went to the bed she had been doing some pretty logical thinking for one not acquainted with the syllogism the honor of the family demanded that this marriage be substantiated marse beverly she said changing the cloth on his head is you got any paper to show you and dat girl was married yes he looked up eagerly i came up here all the way from arkansas to get it i didn't think of it at first we didn't either of us it was all so hurried but when i got to thinking about it down there and specially lately i knew we ought to have it and so i came back mammy i was going to tell father and mother all about it but you know how that went i was too late yes honey said mammy soothingly i know and bout de paper she was afraid he would lapse into sleep or unconsciousness before she found out i went down to old mr marvin's for it last night he was the one that married us and i was bringing it to show to you and tell you about it i thought if anything happened to lois or to me it would be better for you to know about it and you could tell mother what i said and then the man shot me and i didn't know anything more till i came to and where did you put it honey beverly did not answer he had dropped off to sleep from very weakness mammy gave him a little shake she did not dare to wait whar did you put it marse beverly put what oh yes the paper it's in my pocket my breast he had dropped off again when she was sure he was asleep mammy tiptoed to where his clothes lay she searched the breast pocket and every other pocket turning them inside out and shaking the garments the paper was gone had it ever been there this was the question that raised its head again and again as she watched her charge had he ever had the paper or was this flightiness and if he had had it would other people believe it suppose why would anybody want to take a paper like that his watch was gone and his pocket-book it was easy enough to understand that but a paper beverly moved restlessly his wound hurt him and his fever was beginning to rise he opened his eyes as mammy wet the cloth did you find it he panted yes honey mammy said without hesitation i found it hit's put away safe under my bed go to sleep while this search was going on at the cabin lois was receiving her husband's summons and preparing to obey uncle reuben had told her but a modicum of the truth in regard to beverly he had been hurt and she was to come to him that was all except the kindly assurances sent by mammy and the additional ones prompted by his own gentle old heart and so on a mule guided by the old negro beverly trevilian's young wife was brought home to keswick 
uncle reuben shaking his head and thinking mournfully meanwhile of that other day when he had driven marse william and miss betty in state to the keswick in old albemarle it was a sad enough home-coming from the house of the dead to the house of the dying anybody could see that but they were together at last and there was nobody to dispute her right and youth forgets fear when it has love the day after she came mammy drew her into the other room did she know anything about the paper not a thing lois said beverly had said he was going down to mr marvin's to get it and then was coming back to the house but she had waited and waited and he didn't come it was the next morning that the soldiers came and called her father out and she shuddered and crept close to mammy she did not seem at all disturbed at the failure to find the certificate i don't see what difference it makes anyway she said we know we were married all right by a preacher of course it wasn't the presbyterian preacher but that wouldn't make any difference would it mammy hardly knew but thought not and there were two witnesses who was dey mammy caught at a straw why there was father and you see she broke off i told father all about it i promised gordon lay i would the night he came down to see me and i was afraid to take him in the house for fear father would hear us and we stood out by the big lilac bush and talked how come marse gordon to go down dar demanded mammy why he had had a letter from beverly he said telling him all about our being engaged and asking him if he didn't think everything being so uncertain and all that that the best thing would be for us to be married when he came back the next time beverly had told me once that if we ever should be married secretly he thought it would be better to tell gordon or somebody like that that could be trusted all about it beforehand i'm sure i don't know why if father knew about it but that's what he said humph said mammy at that moment she could hardly forgive old man chandler even in his grave and what did marse gordon say lois gave a half pout why he came straight down there that night as soon as he got home and tried to persuade me never never to do it those were his very words even if beverly did want me to he said it would be a great wrong to both of us to be married secretly but i don't think so at all if we loved each other and i wouldn't promise because beverly can just make me do anything and i knew i wouldn't hold out if he talked to me the way he does sometimes mammy could understand beverly could always wheedle her out of her eyes she looked at lois with more sympathy after this and a better understanding of the situation and then gordon said anyway i must never do anything without telling father and i didn't i told father all about it and he went down to mr marvin's with us so it's all right now lois was almost in tears for there was marked disapproval in mammy's looks when was dat marse gordon was down dar oh it was long before we were married lois said she was glad to tell about it her feelings had been so pent up that it was a relief to tell there would have been no stopping the flow now and mammy did not want to stop it she wanted to know it was the very night before the bushwhackers got after him and rene taggart got him off beverly told me all about that and we were not married till nearly the next christmas i had on my who was de other witness interrupted mammy it was mrs marvin mr marvin said we would have to have two and we did so you see it's all right that was just the week before she died i know she was buried on christmas day and a heap she had to be thankful fur when she was grown mammy it seemed to her just then that life with its complications was a good deal less desirable than a safe sleep like mrs marvin's but the childish recital she had listened to and the ignorance of the world it displayed filled her with a sudden tenderness for the girl go on and lay down honey while he's asleep rests all you can the next day mammy left beverly with uncle reuben and lois and trudged down to mr marvin's she did not tell them where she was going it might all be futile but hit's de only chance day is now to get dat stiff kit she said to herself of course i can't get dat same one but i reckon mr marvin will give me another she was growing hourly more anxious to secure it for beverly was not doing well by the road mr marvin's was some distance from keswick but mammy knew a short cut and took it 
there were no signs of life about the place when she got there she knocked and only the echoes answered she knocked again and a hungry cat meowed at her feet meowed ravenously then she opened the door and went in and finding no one there pushed on to the kitchen an astonishing sight met her eyes there an hour by sun as she would have said the marvin dishes were unwashed a tallow candle on the table had burned to the socket and gone out through the open door she could see an unmade bed there was evidence on every hand of a hasty departure and in truth there had been when the order came mr marvin the one preacher left in the neighbourhood had declared that like mr collins he was going to stick it out but the tragedy at old man chandler's was too much for him he had fled having satisfied herself that the occupant of the house was really gone mammy began to experience a feeling of awe it was like being in the house of the dead she edged toward the door of the front room that she had passed through it was so big and so empty if she had been a catholic she would have crossed herself as it was she talked to the cat with her hand on the door-knob and her foot on the step she drew an easier breath and looked around on the table lay the old leather-back bible the covers sewed to the back with flax thread it was the sum total of mr marvin's theological library beside it was his inkhorn and quill pen a split-bottomed chair was pushed back from the table and there was another on the other side this was probably where they sat only night before last when the old man wrote the certificate she was so anxious to get then her eyes fell upon something on the floor that made her forget her fears it was a folded paper and mammy spread it out on the table and scrutinized every letter then she held it off and viewed it at long range she would have given ten years of her life to have been able to read it but when she had looked it up and down right side and wrong side from near and from far she announced her conviction yas sir dat looked to me for all de world like a stiff kit it was a clear case of mind reading for mammy had never seen a stiff kit beverly was resting easier when she got home and she prepared the frugal supper with brightening spirits lois tiptoed out to see her the girl had been so much alone in all these months that she was glad of the old woman's strength to lean upon and with the proof of the marriage in her pocket and the pathetic child face before her mammy felt the upraised barriers of her heart giving way honey she said taking up the thick cornmeal batter and tossing it from one hand to the other till it was the desired oval what do a stiff kit look like a stiff what asked lois she had been watching the operation with fascinated eyes and was thinking of the consistency of batter a stiff kit de paper you get dat shows you're married oh you mean a certificate dat's what i said do you know what dat look like i never saw one said lois thoughtfully but i suppose it's a paper saying that two people are married and telling when and signed with the preacher's name oh yes there would be the names of the witnesses too would they be sort of off to day selves maybe so i don't know why oh nothing i was just studying about it mammy set the oven into which she had put her oval pones on the hearth raked the coals under and around it and covered the lid with hot embers she did it skilfully but the work was mechanical her thoughts were on legal documents dat's a stiff kit show she thought but when lois was eating her supper mammy went out behind the cabin and drew the paper from her capacious pocket examining it with anxious face here's de writin she enumerated and de preacher's name i reckon and off ya to day selves is de yather two names i reckon dey ain't no doubt bout its bein de stiff kit she had made up her mind on the way home not to give it to lois nor to say anything about it to anybody but uncle reuben mars beverly his mind is at rest anyway she thought and miss lois is such a child she just as apt to lose it as any other way she ain't got no sponsibility bout the importance of dat paper she think if mars beverly say dey married de whole world bleege to believe it no sir i ain't gwine take no chances i gwine put dat paper whar it's safe and before she retired she had placed it in the middle of her bed between the straw tick and the feathers 
miss lois she said the next morning is you ever told anybody about you and marse beverly being married not a soul molly driscoll asked me one day if i ever saw beverly nowadays and i told her no that i sometimes saw gordon lay when he came down there to see father but i never saw beverly huh and did marse gordon ever go down dar to see yo pa no but i told her that so that if she ever heard of any man being around there she would think it was gordon i wasn't going to get beverly into trouble you don't reckon it would get marse gordon in trouble do you why of course not said lois in surprise gordon is a federal it wouldn't be strange for him to come to see father but beverly anybody would know that beverly was there to see me did you ever tell anybody else about marse gordon going down to yo all's house lois looked distressed mammy's tone intimated that she had done wrong and lois was not feeling well and could not bear blame i i think i told emmons baird she stammered he came down to our house to see father last winter and he asked me if i ever saw anything of gordon lay and i told him yes i saw him whenever he came down there couldn't be any harm in that because it was so he hadn't been down but twice and i saw him both times emmons baird said he saw us that time we were talking down in the woods goodness i hope he didn't see me when i got to crying i look just awful when i cry what was you crying about asked mammy she was thinking aha dat's de time reuben seed em why i had been up to dr lay's for medicine and when i started home gordon walked part of the way with me as far as he dared and he was talking with me about this very thing and trying to persuade me to give it all up till beverly came home to stay you see he didn't know we were married then but he had had a letter from beverly about something and i told him it was too late and then i was so frightened at what i had said that i got to crying but gordon was real nice to me only he kept begging me to let him go over and tell colonel trevilian all about it our being engaged i mean but i wouldn't do it and he just begged me to he said he had a good mind to tell anyway i think it would have been awfully dishonorable in him if he had when he had promised beverly not to don't you humph said mammy it would have been mighty sensible it would have been dishonorable persisted lois i told him so it wasn't his secret it was ours some things is everybody's secret said mammy well this wasn't nobody knew anything about it but just ourselves and father and mr and mrs marvin yes and two of em dead and t'other one runned away thought mammy and beverly made them promise faithfully not to tell it we just wanted it to be a sweet little secret between ourselves we go long out yonder in de yard ordered mammy with a wave toward the door adding as lois looked at her in grieved astonishment and get some fresh air she stood with arms on her hips a picture of exasperation looking after as she went look to me sometimes like she ain't got de sense of a ten-year-old child a sweet little secret huh end of chapter thirty four chapter thirty five of order number eleven this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon order number eleven by carolyn abbott stanley chapter thirty five the heir comes to his own as the days went by the fight for beverly's life grew fiercer mammy watched him jealously and lois forgot how to smile in her anxiety for the odds were against them mammy's skill renowned in measles and other infantile complaints through which she had successfully carried beverly was powerless before such tasks as probing for balls dressing wounds and warding off blood poisoning her simple remedies were but emollients at best all that ignorant love could suggest and unskilled devotion execute was done but we know now that the battle is not to the loving but to the learned not to her who bathes the brow and kisses the parched lips and weeps over the sufferer as did the helpless young wife but to the one with clear head and strong nerve and steady hand who knows how poor beverly there were other dangers beside those of unskilled nursing to which he was exposed 
and these kept him in constant dread roving bands of jayhawkers and bushwhackers still played hide-and-seek across the prairies and while the chimneys of keswick stood as gloomy heralds of the fact that the worst had been done here and the deserted cabins had little about them that invited cupidity there was always the plea on one side of looking for lurking guerrillas and on the other of seeking needed food the food question usually settled itself there was clearly no hope of forage for men or beast at keswick the other was not so easily disposed of if the jayhawkers should get wind that beverly trevelyan was lying helpless on the estate of his father his chance for life would be slimmer even than it was at the hands of his nurses it was mammy's constant care to prevent such a calamity uncle reuben was kept on guard and at the sight of mounted men instantly gave the alarm his good wife a woman of rare resources had two charms to conjure with one was the rebel flag which virginia and sally had made in the days when the war seemed mainly sewing together the crimson bars and singing the bonny blue flag and talking about the glory of it all the other was a pair of soldier blue trousers and a worn jacket discarded by some kansas man for a suit of beverly's best mammy used them impartially at the alarm of soldiers she always got out both go on down in de bresh honey she would say to lois who usually stood by in an agony of terror you and reuben ain't neither o you got any gift of noratin things get out of de way both o you and i'll tend to it go long then she would ask anxiously which is de old man kin you tell fortunately the cabin was so situated that they were seldom taken by surprise if it proved to be the federals by the time they were there the blue trousers would be ostentatiously hanging over a chair while the flag would have been relegated to a place under mammy's feather tick a time-honored receptacle for colored valuables the first time they came mammy quaked with fear lest beverly himself should betray the secret the next time alas this danger was past beverly was groaning in delirium the men came in and of course wanted to know at once who was in the bed it's a soldier what we found down yonder in de bresh was the truthful answer a soldier how do you know by his breeches said mammy promptly offering them an evidence no sir i don't know who tis Septon tis some po union soldier fightin for his country and i couldn't do nothin but take him in do you reckon they'll allow me some rations for it cap'n she asked anxiously the man was a corporal i'm takin mighty good keer of him and i'm feared it'll bring de bushwhackers down on me look like de government might low me somethin for it are any of the men missing asked the corporal of his companion i think she's lying too stupid looking for that answered the man it certainly is a federal suit mammy followed them to the door you all don't reckon dat's a bushwhacker does you in extreme consternation my lord i don't want to be harboring no seches i wish you'd asked em bout de rations colonel please sir no soldier ever had such rapid promotion as mammy gave in her haste to propitiate and so that danger was averted no of course i don't expect em to bring me de rations she said afterward to uncle reuben but they may think that's what i'm keepin em for maybe dey will the next day the bushwhackers came only two for quantrell's men had had one of their periodical disbandings scattered soldiers argued that leader make a scattered trail the regiment that has but one man to hunt can never find him if only this disbanding could have been permanent the country might have had rest but no sooner was the news of the disintegration spread abroad than operations began again 
and in daredevil fashion they were riding through the country bridles in their teeth a revolver in each hand and murder in their hearts when mammy knew for sure that they were not the federals she thrust the trousers under the bed and laid virginia's little flag near beverly's hand to their questions she answered tis some po rebel soldier i found down yonder in de bresh no sir i don't know his name i just tuck him in for mars beverly's sake de little flag oh i jes put it dar so's he could hold it look like it ease his mind when he's at hisself it do so one of the men advanced to the bed and looked searchingly at the patient poor beverly was past noticing friend or foe that day and mammy was at her wit's end if only she could get a doctor why he cried he lived down in the sny hills this is beverly trevelyan beverly trevelyan exclaimed the other a mere boy to whom mammy had paid no attention on that very account he went to the bedside of the sick man oh my lord young master prayed mammy in an agony of fear don't give him up he ain't going to be here long let him die in peace give him up the boy answered give beverly trevelyan up well i reckon not his mother saved my life last summer look here old woman he squared himself around before her didn't you ever see me before mammy looked at him critically she had seen so many men in the last few years that they had ceased to be of interest to her as men she only noticed the clothes they wore and whether they had wagons that could carry any more things off but as she looked a light broke over her face the light of recognition name her god is you dat child miss betty dun nuss throw a spell our sickness she had never known before that he was a soldier i'm dat child sho he said mimicking her tone but he blushed like a girl for he was at that tender age when a boy of all things wants to be classed as a man well how you is growed said mammy the other man laughed that's encouraging you'll be a man yet before your mother jesse then they turned to the bed haven't you had a doctor for him asked the man no sir dey ain't no doctors left in de country i reckon where's the one that attended on me the boy asked gone to glory said mammy ah lord then to her earnest protestations that if there was a doctor left in jackson county she didn't know it the boy answered with a man's determination well there'll be one tonight or the devil to pay and mammy set hopefully to work preparing bandages she was willing even to work it out with the devil if only they could get a doctor that night a well-known physician of kansas city who may remember the incident for it was not one likely to be forgotten soon was called from his bed at the muzzle of a revolver blindfolded mounted on a swift horse and taken on a mad ride across the prairie between two armed men the bandage was removed from his eyes at beverly trevelyan's bedside dress that man's wound he was told and ask no questions when the work was done and medicines and directions given to mammy the doctor was taken back to the outskirts of kansas city and released with the caution to keep a still tongue in his mouth he's going to die the older one said but we've given him one more chance poor fellow i wish i knew who fired that shot said the boy he was thinking how fine it was to track a man as the days went by the three watchers nursed and prayed dat's an awful bad sign pickin at de bed clothes said mammy shaking her head and did you hear dat ole hound last night 
he said in an undertone to uncle reuben she had grown strangely tender of the young girl who watched beside her one day the picking ceased and lois who caught at every straw and did not have the older woman's experience asked if he did not seem quieter yes mammy said shaking her head wasn't that a good sign lois asked anxiously and mammy turned away there came a day when the cord was loosed and the mourners went about the place there was nobody in the neighborhood to call upon even mr collins had fled after the tragedy that brought lois to keswick empty houses only would have echoed their cry had they sent it forth no sign or sound of life broke the stillness of that great prairie no motion of living thing save the flocks of evil birds that circled and swooped and battened on what shuddering one dare not ask they buried him under the willow that the old man had planted so many years ago and never was dead laid away by gentler hands the coffin was made from charred boards of the house that was to have been his and the tears that fell upon it from the old man's eyes were more in number than the nails he drove into it it was rudely fashioned it was hardly fit for a trevelyan but they made him a bed of the autumn flowers that grew in his mother's garden and when the faithful hands that had robed him on his entrance into life had robed him for his solemn exit they placed him in it and laid over his heart the little flag that virginia had made and so under the willow in the six feet of earth that we all may claim amid the flowers that love had planted and love had plucked and with the emblem of the cause he had fought for on his breast the heir of keswick came to his own ah many hopes were buried thus in sixty three when it was over they took the young wife back to the cabin there was nowhere else for her to go they never once thought of trying to rid themselves of her these white souls whose skins were black in the gray dawn of the september morning that followed the two old negroes sat before the embers of the open fire they did not notice that it needed wood though they shivered now and then and their lips were ashen on mammy's breast that had pillowed the head of the father lay beverly trevelyan's infant son and from the room beyond came the babble of a girlish voice and a gurgle of laughter now and then that chilled the blood end of chapter thirty five recording by john brandon chapter thirty six of order number eleven this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon order number eleven by carolyn abbott stanley chapter thirty six mammy visits the provost marshal it was weeks after this that mammy stood one morning on the horse blocks vainly trying to coax the old army mule up to a sufficient degree of nearness for her to fall upon him her jumping days being over the mule casting his remaining eye at her generous girth prudently stepped aside each time at the critical moment mammy was arrayed in a faded black calico riding skirt and a freshly ironed and slatted sunbonnet which betokened a journey uncle reuben stood by with a bundle of flannel and cambric held gingerly in his arms they never left the child alone one moment for in the cabin its mother still babbled softly and crooned and laughed reuben lay that child down in the grass and come here 
and take hold this fool animule look like he ain't never seed a ridin skirt before and indeed the beast did seem to be in rebellion and ready to try his hand with the rest at secession he doubtless felt that the talents of a government employee even though somewhat past his prime were being put to ignoble uses this september morning what you layin off to tell him dilsey the feat had been accomplished and mammy sat triumphant a rotund mass on the back of the subdued bucephalus how i know what i gwine to say asked mammy gathering up the lines and settling herself in the saddle tell i know how fur de gwine push me i don't never tell a story doubt i have to but if they push me now the sentence was unfinished indicating the wide latitude she allowed herself delcy i might have feared the devil'll get ye some day said uncle reuben seriously he greatly disapproved of mammy's facile tongue how come the devil gwine to get me for tellin' lies demanded mammy ain't he de father of them i reckon he can't deny the trade you take care dat child she called back if you don't you'll think something wasn't the devil's done cut you dat you will and they plodded on she had got an early start for the way was long and the mule not swift she was bound for independence to answer a summons to appear before the provost marshal of course the summons had not been for her but for her husband as the nominal head of the house but mammy had more confidence in her own powers of narration as we have seen than in those of her simple-hearted god-fearing truth-loving spouse she determined therefore to answer the call herself putting her husband's failure to appear on the ground of rheumatism and consequent inability the case of the wounded soldier harbored at their house had been reported and also the fact that he was now missing their solemn protestation that he was dead was not taken as conclusive and they were required to report at the military post they had been thrown into the greatest alarm by the summons for the law in its mysterious operations is an awesome thing to children and negroes on grand prairie they had become somewhat accustomed to lawlessness they certainly had had fine opportunity to do so but the law that was different the old woman ambled on looking back from time to time at the pitiful little row of cabins which was all that was left of the glory of the trevelyan estate it don't look much that keswick she mourned i reckon de feastin days is over it was a ride to discourage even the stout-hearted and mammy's soul had been very downcast since beverly's death on every side were burned fences and blackened fields and the ruins of homes her progress was marked by ejaculations and groans it was the first time she had left keswick since the church was burned when she came to dr lay's she rode up to the silent house unhindered by fence or gate she would have got down and gone in had she not had the fear of remounting before her eyes and also if the truth were told a superstitious fear of going into the house whose owner had been thrust so violently out of life her curiosity got the better of her fears however and she rode up close to the windows of the sitting-room it was a double house upon the orthodox plan two rooms and a passage above and below she could easily see into the room from her elevation on the mule's back it was dismantled and bare nothing was left but a large isabella stove and the bookcases built in the wall the books were gone 
she turned the animal's head to the road again glad to get away from the brooding spirit of desolation that lay over the place it was afternoon when she reached independence she inquired of a man the way to the provost's office and went straight thither everybody knew the way to the provost in those days two or three men were in the office when she went in one of them a fine-looking federal officer rather in the background he was evidently there more from curiosity than anything else and it certainly was an admirable place to study human nature and existing conditions mammy had removed her riding skirt and bonnet and stood in respectful silence till the provost or his deputy or whoever it was should look up then she made him her best curtsy well said the man abruptly what do you want mammy protested her entire absence of wants and the man asked her name which she gave adding the information that she belonged to colonel trevelyan of keswick de soldier said you wanted to see my old man sir and he was dat poly dat i's bleeged to come in his place sir after a few minutes consultation with the deputy and some papers the provost turned to her you are charged he said ponderously with aiding and abetting the enemy is this true no sir said mammy it ain't true you hear my racket i ain't bettin on none of em i think de whole kitten villains half devils the officer over by the window looked vastly amused this was a new type to him mammy's free and easy words were without a suspicion of impudence she was only expressing her opinion in her own way haven't you been caring for a rebel soldier in your house she was asked in de cabin you mean dey ain't no house left well de cabin then haven't you yes sir i have mammy admitted well in doing that you've been giving him aid and comfort you acknowledge that no sir i ain't give him any aid i didn't have none to give him we ain't got nothin left but de old mule and he's de most ungodly's old creetur ever switched a tail she added recalling his actions at the horse blocks then she returned to the accusation aid and comfort my lord we all ain't had no comfort ourselves since de white folks gone let alone given of it to anybody else i jest nussed him sir dat's all i done i ain't given no aid and comfort no sir who was this man you were harboring she was asked pointedly mammy hesitated for a brief second it could do no possible harm that she could see to tell this now and as she had said she never prevaricated unless there was a reason for it dat was mars beverly trevelyan sir she said slowly and impressively my young master what giant price's army at de beginning of de wall yas sir well that's what you're charged with aiding and abetting the enemy mammy looked at him in unfeigned amazement you call mars beverly de enemy humph if he's de enemy who in de name of god you going to call de friends well who do you call the enemy asked the man he had caught the infection of the officer's quiet amusement and was willing to have a little fun with her i call dem de enemy was doin de devilment she returned promptly killin and plunderin and runnin off de stock and ticin off dem niggers and come that will do he felt that he had given her too much license now i want you to tell me the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth yassir that's what i was gwine to do 
but you can't tell de truth about jackson county not down our way don't you bring in de jayhawkers and de redlegs no sir dey done work de zevs into de noration capital said the officer in a low tone to another who had joined him that's about what they've done yazer dems who i call de enemy why dey burnt mars williams house sir and dey took de white folks clothes dey did and miss nanny's silk dresses and her set of pearls what was gwine to be miss virginia's on her wedding day she stopped abruptly and turned to look at the officer by the window look to me lack like dat's de vay one de took em she said she had observed that the man was laughing at her and was willing to avenge herself i know him by dat mole on his face there was a roar of laughter from the officers in which the suspect joined and mammy with a hardly perceptible smile turned back to the provost de soldiers called him lieutenant tigerman you're off the scent this time old lady spoke up the officer my name is black mammy turned and looked over silently the men waiting with interest to see the outcome then she turned back to the group around the provost yaza a heap of em has forsook de names but look like you can't denounce a mole dat sticks to you there was another laugh at the officer's expense and then the provost said sternly what was beverly trevelyan's business here i never heerd him say sir do you know no sir where did you find him down in de bresh do you mean he was bushwhacking no sir he was layin dar wounded and bleedin to death when i found him in point of fact wasn't he going straight to your house when he was shot yaza i reckon he was mammy was serious enough now and so were the others but what else could he do sir she asked with simple eloquence de house was burned his pa and ma was drove off there wasn't no neighbors war could he go sir seppin twas to his mammy's house the provost wrote on without looking up you knew he was a rebel he said why did you take him in mammy towered above him in a dignity born of the occasion why did i take mars beverly in she repeated why sir he was my child when my little reuben died and miss betty was so sick mars william give em to me i raised em sir a nussed em from dis old breast she struck her bosom with a gesture as dramatic as it was unstudied could i turn him off when he was dying the officer turned to his companion with a look of wonder on his face it beats the devil he said had he come down here to loose a people from bonds like this by degrees they got the whole story from her at least so much as she thought best to tell she said nothing about the wife or child so far as she could find out no living soul knew about this but herself and uncle reuben respect for the family honor more than anything else kept her silent about it she had always felt that it was a disgrace it was not her business she considered to make it known there were serious faces in that office as she told of his death and burial beverly trevelyan was known to many of them of course he was a rebel but it was a sad end if any of you knows whar mars william is i wished you'd try and get de word to him she said as she concluded and there was nobody to jest this time is de anything to pay sir she asked hesitatingly 
looking much relieved when told there was not cause we ain't got nothin but de mule left she explained and as i told you he's mighty obnoxious sir in the laugh that followed she bowed herself out the officer by the window followed her here old lady he called i don't know your name dilsey sir aunt dilsey did generally calls me de young uns anyway aunt dilsey then he spoke it awkwardly not being accustomed to the familiarity of the appellation he put a green back into her hand here take this and get yourself something to eat thank ye sir thank ye young master cried mammy she did not know why it should be given to her she had done nothing but that money was a godsend i hope you'll excuse me sir about dat mole i knowed all de time you want a man i was just foolin you got de advantage of dat man in de place your mole done choose for hisself hisn was on his nose and i reckon you got right smart de advantage of him in de family you was born in too i don't know whether you come from old Virginia, sir but you surely is got de marks of de quality yaza dat you is end of chapter thirty six recording by john brandon chapter thirty seven of order number eleven this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org order number eleven by caroline abbott stanley chapter thirty seven a nation scattered and peeled it was the day after mammy's triumphant return from independence with saddle-bags whose off-side could hardly hold the sundries into which that greenback had been transmuted there was tea for the invalid who turned away from the decoction of sassafras which was the best they had to offer and a precious package of sugar there was paragoric for infantile emergencies and cold chicken for those of age down in one corner were a paper of needles and a spool of cotton jot child gwine to need short dresses fo long mammy had said he's mighty servigrous in his legs but it cannot be denied that the greater part of the saddle-bags if one may speak of them in the plural when the femininity of both saddle and rider had made them strictly a one-sided singular was taken up with twists of tobacco for the mutual delectation of the old couple it should be said in strict justice however that the very first purchase of all had been a rubber rattle and a blue ribbon to hang it on a tin one had been offered her but she would none of it dat chow ain't no po white trash she thought dis year one is just like de one his pa had po little lamb nobody could have told of which little lamb she was thinking possibly she did not know herself she had been very jubilant over the success of the trip detailing it to uncle reuben with the circumstantiality natural to a traveller who did not often take so long a one the visit to dr lay's and the discovery of the old isabella had put a new notion in their heads if they continued to keep their new charge and there seemed no possibility of their doing anything else they would need another fire uncle reuben had gone over to see the lay of the land literally and ascertain whether the old sled and the maligned mule would be equal to transporting it to keswick if he waited for snow there might be nothing to transport even stoves were game when nothing else was in sight one such was taken to pleasant hill by a strolling visitor and returned at the close of the war the borrower said to the owners afterwards that he needed it and then he thought it would be safer in his house than in theirs and he was doubtless right uncle reuben had made his observations and was ready to start home it had been a mournful investigation the empty rooms reverberated with the sound of his halting steps preternaturally loud they seemed in the stillness 
mournful ejaculations fell from his lips and he shook his head continually as he went from room to room how often he had driven the white folks through that big gate he was thinking as he stood by the window and looked out the gate was gone now burned with the fence he was starting down the stairs when a step below and an exclamation startled him he drew back and peered through the balusters a young man in soldier clothes stood in the doorway he was looking into the bare rooms with hard-set face it was gordon lay he had landed at kansas city with his regiment that morning the news of order number eleven had reached him soon after its issue and he had been in a frenzy of anxiety to get tidings of their fate but the trumpet a soldier follows his duty not love he could not leave his regiment he had written letter after letter they lay uncalled for in the little post office he wrote to his sister in kentucky but her answer failed to reach him he was shifted so from pillar to post he had asked for a furlough only to be met with the answer that the regiment would soon be transferred to the border and he must wait what was one man amid the tumult of war in sixty three rumors had come to him that filled him with terror of fleeing refugees burning houses and endangered women the butchery at lawrence he knew was bound to bring swift reprisal and he shuddered to think what that reprisal might be and whom it might strike those were agonizing days for gordon if only he could know when the boat reached kansas city that morning and the regiment was disembarked he went straight to his commanding officer and laid the case before him asking leave of absence if but for a day it was granted and he had come in haste his fears increased with every mile they had become well nigh insupportable he urged his horse to its utmost speed and yet he felt from the first that there was nothing he could do it was a month or more since the order was issued what might not happen in a month he was hastening only to learn the worst it was indeed a scene of desolation that he looked upon the fields that he had left in smiling beauty lay blackened and waste there had been few crops raised in the last two years there were not many able-bodied men left for the plough and the harrow they were busy with the sword and the rifle and the little there was had not been gathered into barns gordon lay was versed in the scriptures throughout that ride the lamentations of the prophet were sounding continually in his ears he said them over at every turn of the road the land mourneth for the corn is wasted the harvest of the field is perished alas for the day here and there as he looked across the prairie a zigzag line of ashes told where a fence had been the blackened swath on either side showed where it had gone it did not matter much now about the fences there were no crops left for the brute creation to ravage and no stock to do it had there been the fields were in briars and thistles the stock was in kansas on every hand gordon saw with sinking heart the ruins of homes here a prostrate mass of brick and mortar that had once been a rendezvous for the gayest of the gay there two stone chimneys which measured the breadth of the house that was and stood like grim sentinels to challenge attention and herald the fact that here a household once lived and loved and toiled and gathered and lost they were not always recent ruins sometimes they would have vines over them a fragrant climbing honeysuckle that was not quite buried when the crash came or the old grapevine that had covered the back porch and tried to do its duty still creeping over the unsightly pile and budding and blossoming and bearing fruit at any rate it made a shadow from the heat for the lizard and the slug how could it know in its insensate heart that the soul of that home was gone and only its bleaching bones were to be sheltered henceforth there seemed to gordon something infinitely pathetic in the sight of the summer houses and grape arbors more even than in the wasted fields such things speak so of human life and its joys once he noticed what had been a child's swing the rope cut as high as a man's hand could reach and the ends dangling from the limbs of the walnut tree under it was the path worn bare by little feet the rope had been used to tie up the bedding that went to kansas where were the children occasionally he would see houses that the torch had failed to find or more merciful than its fellows had spared he rode up to some of them they were always empty where were the people often there were signs of recent occupation an axe sticking in a log at the woodpile a basket of chips gathered and left and he noticed frequently at the horse blocks children's bulky playthings that had been brought out in the forlorn hope of taking them along 
and abandoned as impossible apparently before starting in one place was a little red cart surely that might have been taken he did not know that that family went out as the holy family took their flight into egypt the mother on a mule with the weeping owner of the cart in her lap while the aged grandfather walked at their side if only the cart could have carried the baby it might have gone along as he drew nearer home gordon's gloom deepened these places were all familiar to him each one had its memories and they were all a young man's memories bright and joyous it did not seem to him that they could ever be the abode of anything happy again joy seemed blotted out of the world the chimney sentinels grew thicker he remembered virginia's writing to him that she had stood on the portico at keswick one night and counted twenty burning buildings it had seemed incredible he could believe it now the chimneys corroborated the story he raised himself in the saddle and drew in a long breath exhaling it with a sudden explosive force the vast stillness oppressed him it was broken only by his horse's hoofs there was not a sound not a sign of life on all that broad prairie it was a relief to him to pass through a stretch of timber and hear a blue jay something was alive anyway a squirrel ran out on the limb of a tree with its tail whisked over its back in the old familiar fashion gordon looked at it with a strange feeling of interest he and beverly used to go hunting for squirrels how had he ever been so cruel as to shoot one he felt the remorse of the ancient mariner when with his cruel bow he laid full low the harmless albatross he had never realized before how much the bark of dog the lowing of the herd and all the common barnyard sounds gave cheer and tone to country scene even the discordant cry of the peacock or the guinea hen would have sounded sweet there was such a polar stillness over everything it chilled his soul he pressed on from the hill just beyond he knew he could see virginia's home and his own his heart was beating a tattoo that made him forget the stillness it had been so long since he had seen her when he reached the hill he stopped short a groan burst from his lips the white pillars streaked with smoke were outlined against the blue sky he looked to the right his own home was standing thank god for that but would there be anybody there after all he had this day seen he did not dare to hope it when he reached the house he flung his bridle over the post half expecting to see a negro boy come shambling from the rear none came he strode to the open door with some wonder that it should be open he did not know that it was better thus than locked for then it would surely be battered in he stopped on the threshold one glance told him the worst they were not there he went through it room by room the parlor had with wanton vandalism been used for stabling horses the walls of tinted lavender were covered with obscene writing and pictures the floors bore evidence of having been hastily dismantled for the straw was left and there were tags of carpeting where it had been torn up there was nothing left but the old isabella uncle reuben had taken the opportunity when the newcomer had gone to the back rooms to tiptoe softly down the stairs he had not recognized gordon and he had learned from bitter experience that while loneliness is bad objectionable neighbors are worse he proposed to leave this prowling young soldier in full possession slipping behind a rose-bush he awaited his opportunity to retire unobserved he was too late there was the click of a revolver and gordon stepped boldly to the other side of the rose-bush bushes had a way of yielding strange fruit in those days he would see what this was at sight of the old man his hand dropped uncle reuben why my lord in heaven it's mars gordon well mars gordon i certainly is glad to see you sir i is indeed where did you come from demanded gordon from keswick sir de cabins ain't burnt hits de house tell me about the family where are they you mean our family sir yes and mine too where are they all dey gone sir where where's my father uncle reuben's jaw dropped and his face grew ashen he stared at the young man with dilating eyes mars gordon sir ain't you heard heard no i have heard nothing where is my father the old man stood with bowed head then with a gesture toward the heavens smiling blue and serene above them as if from that far height they looked down upon no sin and sorrow he said solemnly war de wicked cease from troubling and de weary is at rest my god End of chapter 37
of order number eleven this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org order number eleven by caroline abbott stanley chapter thirty eight gordon takes the helm my god it was the cry lifted up on calvary it has been the outpouring of stricken hearts ever since it filled the air in sixty three where the cannon crashed and the battle raged and at home next day when the lists were read it fell from the lips of beardless boys who had not got away from their mother's god it rose from hearts unused to pray it was wrung often oh so often from anguished ones kneeling by empty beds my god it is the soul's instinctive appeal for help in danger in bereavement from the terror that cometh by night and the arrow that flieth by day the pestilence that walketh in darkness and the destruction that wasteth at noonday whether we trust or whether we scoff it is all the same when extremity comes we feel a need that reaches out and up we were strong but now we are weak and all alike we pray my god it is humanity's cry in the dark uncle reuben's tale was one little calculated to reassure the bereaved son he felt more and more his mother's need of him and where was she where were they all on this point the old man graphic and reliable as he was on what he knew was at fault geography was a sealed book to him to all of gordon's questions and entreaties he could only say marse gordon sir i been chastisin my memory to think o dat place but i've clean forgot de name think hard gordon urged was it st louis no sir don't look like dat was de name it wasn't kansas city no sir uncle reuben repudiated this thought with scorn he did know that kansas city was to the west dey tuck de lexington road could it have been kentucky he felt sure that his mother would go straight to his married sister in kentucky hence his main anxiety now was to get the destination of the trevilians uncle reuben shook his head no sir dat want de town seem like i heerd something about yo ma goin dar but not mars william no sir gordon mentioned several possible places he really had very little idea what point colonel trevilian would be likely to select his kindred were all in virginia but of course he had not gone there uncle reuben was thinking deeply mars gordon he said with a gleam of hope you don't reckon dat place could a been charlottesville gordon turned away in despair they went over to the cabin and on the way uncle reuben unfolded to him the other sad tale of beverly and beverly's wife and child for a part of this he was partially prepared but the death of his friend was a blow as was lois's condition she just lays dar talkin to herself and singin sort o low like to de rag baby why dilsey done made her she don't know dat ain't a show nuff child no sir why mars gordon she tries to nuss it when mammy saw gordon her joy knew no bounds she immediately slipped from her bent shoulders to his strong ones the burden she had been carrying she was not much accustomed to responsibility of a grave sort having all her life had questions settled for her necessity had pressed it upon her in these latter days but at the sight of a white face she transferred it promptly deferring to his judgment in all things they took him in to see the girl she was propped up in bed her golden hair falling about her like a sunlit cloud and her face beautiful as he had never seen it an etherealized beauty that smote his heart poor beverly she looked at him with unrecognizing glance when he took her hand and spoke a troubled look came into her eyes as if sleeping memories had been stirred and she lifted the grieved chin of a child to him will beverly come to-day 
he turned away he could not trust himself to speak it was with strange sensations that he stood beside the might of humanity that lay in mammy's lap which they told him was beverly trevilian's child a great wave of pity swept over him this little one had come into life heavily freighted without much thought he held out his finger to the tiny hand it closed upon it instantly it's a trick babies have of worming themselves into people's hearts it thrilled the man like an appeal beverly's child and beverly had never seen it it would never know a father's care nor a low sound came to them from the other room the soft croon of a cradle song to the tune of come thou fount of every blessing hush my dear lie still in slumber holy angels guard thy bed she's puttin de rag child to sleep whispered mammy she does dat constant gordon's strong hand closed around the helpless one that clutched his finger poor little orphan fatherless and motherless marse gordon said mammy looking down anxiously into the wrinkled face does you see de favor of marse beverly in dis child seem to me he looks mo like miss lois's folks den he do like his own folks from his two humble friends for they were drawn close together now by a common sorrow and a common interest gordon heard all the details the sack of keswick the exodus and later beverly's sickness and death the only place where their memories failed was at the destination of the families this is not to be wondered at uncle reuben and mammy were like unlettered children to them there were two places in the world missouri and Virginia, or more specifically jackson county and albemarle and then such a flood of calamities had come upon them in the last few weeks it is not strange that an unknown name should have been swept away but it made gordon's search infinitely harder dilsey said uncle reuben at length is you done forgot dat paper mammy put the baby into gordon's arms before he could either retreat or enter a protest here mars gordon take dis child you got to learn how some time he held it gingerly afraid to move lest he should break it afraid to stir lest it should cry watching its little wrinkled puckery face with a strange fascination beverly's child mammy turned back the corner of her feather bed and drew forth a package gordon put the baby into uncle reuben's arms and turned to her here tis mars gordon here's de stiff kit the marriage certificate he cried oh what a help where did you get it i was afraid they might not have one mammy related with pardonable pride the story of how it was lost and found yes sir she said exultantly i was bound to have dat stiff kit i want gwine to let nobody take away dat child's mess of potash ef i could help it no sir gordon took the paper smiling at her words a marriage certificate would straighten things out wonderfully in years to come as he read his smile faded is it all right mars gordon asked mammy anxiously no mammy he said and he said it with great gentleness it is not the certificate at all it is a receipt mammy dropped into a chair then as the full force of it came to her she turned to uncle reuben give me de chile she said brokenly po lamb po lamb gordon had not the heart to tell her what the paper that she had been guarding with such jealous care was it was a receipt for half soling a pair of shoes dated in arkansas and drawn up in beverly's writing the consideration mentioned in the document for the service rendered was one hundred and fifty dollars confederate money it was signed joel his ex crawford mark in the corner at the left hand were the names of two witnesses john pasco and ike swamscott and after the latter name was scrawled high private in the rear ranks gordon could see the whole scene the hilarity with which the receipt had been demanded and given and duly witnessed and how it had been preserved to laugh over afterward 
the contrast between that scene and this seemed almost ghastly uncle reuben picked up the package dilsey done forgot de letters he said and beverly took them marse gordon mammy interrupted she would not give it up yet ain't dey some sort of book war de marriages and taxes and things is wrote down yes but you know mammy things have been in such a state in this part of the country that everything has gone to pieces there are no county officers now and even the books are gone i am afraid we will have to give it up he took the letters there were two of them written by beverly trevilian when the sands of life were running low one was to his father the other to gordon you take em both mars gordon i don't know what to do wid dat letter you get it to mars william when you find out whar dey is i done promised mars beverly gordon took the letters and rose the very sight of them stirred him he could not read his here he went to the willow beneath whose shade he and beverly had so often lain and talked and planned the future they used to go there sometimes to play mumble peg the place was full of surging memories to him as indeed what spot about keswick was not standing by the mound where the other one lay he read the letter it was written on a leaf torn from a notebook and was short the writing faltered at the last and grew shaky it seemed to him like a message from the other world dear gordon it said i am almost gone mammy tries to make me think i shall get well but i know to-day i never shall i wish i could oh how i wish i could for the sake of the little girl who is sitting by me my wife you were right in what you said that day gordon i oughtn't to have married her till the war was over but i did and then when she wrote me i couldn't stay away i had to come but it brought me to my death gordon will you take care of her until you can find father i have written to him but we don't know where he is i know you will be sure to come back here and i'm writing this to leave for you it's hard to go but you'll take care of her won't you gordon we've fought on different sides but i know you'll forget that for the sake of old times the words straggled off across the page as if the hand had failed then the writing began again there was something else that must be said tell mother it's all right with me good-bye it had no signature it did not need any gordon stood motionless a swaying pendant touched his cheek when it swept back the willow leaves were wet he caught the branch and held it with a grip such as he might have given a hand bev old fellow the boyish name slipped from him unawares they seemed very close to each other then the living and the dead he looked up to the skies and raised his right hand his lips were firm set so help me god he said that night gordon lay sat out on the horse blocks where he and virginia and mrs trevilian used to sit studying the stars he was not doing that now he was trying to think it out lois needed care medical care that was the first thing if her malady were taken in time it might be cured he was physician enough to know that every day lessened this probability if he waited to hear from colonel trevilian before moving in the matter it might be too late what ought he to do then even if he should be immediately successful in the search which he intended to institute was it not likely that his letter would find colonel trevilian in no financial condition to meet this new obligation perhaps even in no physical condition after all he had been through to make such a trying journey there was no question that she ought to be taken to the asylum this was no place for her certainly ought he not to do it there was no thought in his mind that the thing would have a sinister appearance he would not have harbored it had there been beverly had left her to his care until his father should be found there was nobody else to take the responsibility mammy even could not be spared to go with them there was nothing to do but for him to take her to fulton this settled his thoughts turned to virginia and his mother his own family he felt sure would go directly to kentucky he would write immediately to his sister there making inquiries and would send a letter to virginia for sally to forward of course sally would know where they were and it would save time it would be ten days or two weeks then before he could hope for a reply but when he did he went off then into a blissful reverie from which he stirred himself at last to go to the pallet that mammy had spread for him in the loom house he told them of his plan the next morning it was not questioned except as to the possibility of it i thought de asylum had been shut up in durin of de war mammy said 
she had heard them tell of its being closed by order of governor jackson early in sixty one that the bedding might be used for the soldiers she remembered it because of the talk it made when the patients were sent back to their respective counties to their homes in the poor houses and jails it has just been reopened gordon answered how soon could she go i reckon she could go most any time i'm just keepin her in de bed cause dat seem like hit's the safe place fur her get her clothes ready then and as soon as i can get leave of absence i will take her down marse gordon you ain't gwine take little beverly is you mammy spoke anxiously she had named the child herself you can have the baby until we hear from colonel trevilian i think he belongs to you by good right he certainly couldn't be in better hands i'll send the cow down as soon as i get to kansas city yas yeah, sir ef you please sir look like old star ain't gwine hold out till his little toofs come mammy had adopted another generation and so one day they put the gentle sweet-faced girl with her belongings in a carriage and gordon drove her to the station where they took the train for fulton mammy had made her a fresh rag child and dressed it in a real baby dress and shawl and cap for the journey it seemed the last thing she could do for her the girl had fallen into a settled melancholy now and hugged the baby to her and wept softly as they rode in the cars gordon watching her from his seat behind he spoke to her occasionally but she would only shake her head and weep afresh who is it you've got there asked a man he met on the train the man had known gordon in the old neighborhood nobody that you know i think gordon said briefly it is a lady i am taking to a place of safety jackson county is no place now for any woman that can get away he did not care to enlighten the man who was a garrulous gossip despite his sex the girl was young and beautiful the man looked at the trio and drew his own conclusions he repeated them afterward as facts it is a way we have of carrying on the devil's work End of chapter thirty eight chapter thirty nine of order number eleven this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org order number eleven by caroline abbott stanley chapter thirty nine forty years ago gordon lay was sitting in the low ceiled bare reception room of the state lunatic asylum in front of him was the mild-mannered sharp-eyed superintendent of that institution who always saw to the bottom of things through or over his spectacles it was his business to ask questions and he was a past master in the art when that conference came to an end gordon felt that he had been on the witness stand many another has felt the same way but the mild-mannered gentleman's questions were always pertinent if searching and the lowliest was accorded courteous treatment a rare man was dr t r h smith the state's unfortunates could not have fallen into better hands poor lois had been taken in charge by the kind-hearted matron who had recently been installed and was so new to the business that her heart bled for every arrival and they were very frequent just now from the remotest borders of the state came pouring back the forlorn ones if anybody is in doubt of the insane asylums being the best fruit of an advanced civilization let him witness the closing of one for two years and the reopening the girl had shown no feeling at parting with gordon but hugged to her breast the doll you say you cannot certify this marriage the superintendent was saying no sir i have only the word of my friend in the letter he left me you could not get a certificate of marriage from the minister who performed the ceremony no sir not at present he left the county as everybody else did under order number eleven and i have no means of knowing where he is do you know that he is alive no sir you do not even know that colonel trevilian will receive her as his daughter no sir but yes just a moment suppose he should repudiate this marriage and declined to burden himself with the young woman's support what would you wish us to do is she then to be turned over to the county 
i should not wish her to be put upon the county gordon said firmly she is my dead friend's wife until she is recognized by her husband's family you may look to me for her support ah the superintendent lowered his head and looked at the young man over his glasses his face was inscrutable but gordon flushed under his gaze i hardly feel that we would be justified lieutenant lay in receiving this young woman under the name of trevilian she will be entered as miss lois chandler the change of name can be made at any time that colonel trevilian directs it and so poor lois was denied even in a lunatic asylum the poor dignity of her matron's title and her husband's name in the time that had intervened between his visit to the old neighborhood and his trip to fulton gordon had made haste to communicate with his sister and had had the cheering assurance that his mother mrs devereux and sally were safe under her roof she did not know about the trevilians on his return to kansas city he found a letter there from his mother at the close of it she said we have just found out where the trevilians are when we left them at lexington where we took the boat for st louis they expected to go to boonville and we wrote there as soon as we got to kentucky we could not imagine why we did not hear from them it seems that they changed their plans and went on to jefferson city where they now are gordon ground his teeth why hadn't he known this before his trip to fulton he had passed through jefferson city twice going and coming the last time he had been there a day and night his mother continued gordon virginia trevilian is the bravest girl i ever saw i don't know what we should have done without her on that fearful journey and do you know she walked all the way to lexington of course her father did too for that matter but such things are hard on a woman we went very slowly having nothing but the calves to the cart and one old worn-out army horse that sister and sally rode time about it wouldn't carry double and really i don't think it would have been able to i wanted virginia to let me walk sometimes while she took my place in the cart but she wouldn't hear to it i really think she felt that she must be near her father he was in a dreadful state the night keswick was burned he just seemed to give up oh my son we have lived through frightful scenes i pray god the end may come soon when i think of all we have passed through in jackson county i wonder we are not more of us in the lunatic asylum on the way down we all tried to help each other and be as cheerful as we could but it was easier for virginia and sally than for those of us who are older though miss nanny did say she caught virginia crying once just for a few minutes gordon wrote to virginia that night explaining that he had been through jefferson city but did not know they were there he did not tell her his business the next day he wrote to colonel trevilian telling beverly's sad story and his own action in regard to lois this letter took more time than the one to virginia for the story must be tenderly told he enclosed in it the one beverly had written and mailed it then he sat down to wait with such patience as he could command the stock was not large it must be admitted he was in a fever of anxiety to know how they were faring even the little glimpse his mother had given him of her made her dearer to him she was brave and his mother loved her already it would be hard to break virginia's spirit he thought with a throb of pride letters came promptly from kentucky but he looked in vain for a jefferson city postmark he went to the office three times a day though he knew the third time would be fruitless unless they had overlooked it when our friends fail us we always revile the postmaster the missouri pacific had not reached kansas city yet and the mail had to be brought from the terminus in the old way except that a citizen's guard had been added there were people in the town that he knew and he might have spent his leisure time with them but he felt no inclination for society instead he put in his time when he was off duty in tramping up and down the hills that are now kansas city in threading the ravines that later gave direction to her thoroughfares and strolling aimlessly over the call bottom checkered to-day with a labyrinth of tracks and switches and railroad yards alive with cars from the four corners of the earth and puffing locomotives that switch and snort and make night hideous with their groans and seem to be entirely out of their head it was virgin bottom then 
sometimes he would clamber like a goat up the bluff overlooking all this where the squatters cabins perch like swiss chalets on shelving terraces and one half expects to hear an alpine horn and see the chamois leap from cliff to cliff then wearied out with the steep climb he would sit on the brink of the precipice that is now bellevue avenue and from that unrivalled point of vantage look out upon the world and all the kingdoms of it stretched below him the endless plain covered with sunflowers and the great river which makes an elbow here and then flows on turbid and raging sometimes and full of fierce power slashing into fruitful farms and undermining the sycamores till at last they drop helplessly into its insatiable maw but oftener so weary and tired of it all that it has not strength or decency to cover its own bare bones which stretch out in long lines of treacherous sandbar as he sat looking at all this of what was gordon thinking of thomas benton missouri's great prophet who with packing houses and factories and grain elevators and teeming railroad stations pictured on the retina of his far-seeing eye while yet they were not had said this will be the site of a great commercial and manufacturing community some day no of john c fremont who after treading many passages and opening many doors had declared this is the key to the immense territory to the west of us not at all he was thinking of virginia and whether it was time for the mail to be in sometimes he would stroll down the levee looking at the signs many of which bore spanish and french names for the santa fe trade had been a power in western missouri and its outfitting posts had crept westward year by year from old franklin to boonville and fort osage and liberty and independence and finally to its natural place kansas city the old levee had been a busy place in those palmy days if its business life was crowded into the narrow space under the bluff it was but concentrated and made up in intensity what it lost in breadth those were the days when it was worth while to live in a river town with a great fleet of steamboats and packets and barges and flatboats and river craft of every sort gliding endlessly by the old missouri was teeming with life then palatial steamboats with gaily dressed ladies sitting on the guards and bands and calliopes playing ploughed the muddy waves and missed the sandbars when they could the names of boats and captains were as household words they vied with one another then in bed and board and people tell yet of the tables they set and how the missouri river water is the best water in the world when it has settled in the fifties the boats came in loaded to bursting from hold to hurricane deck horses and wagons cattle and mules below furniture and household goods piled high aloft and humanity sandwiched in between the west was taking on a great impetus then the wilderness was stretching out its hands and even the buffaloes were ready to be stripped when the boat came in then people went down to the landing to meet it and see the newcomers it was the great commercial mart there was drumming to be done for the hotels real estate agencies and outfitting houses it was the popular recreation to go there it took the place of golf links and football grounds yes a busy place was the levee from fifty five to sixty one the new town was the natural distributing point for kansas kansas emigrants with nasal twang and sparse belongings looked with faith to the promised land beyond the call and border ruffians glared at them from under broad-brimmed hats negro stevedores went back and forth over the gangway and emptied the steamboat's load wherever a place could be found for it and often the place was under the canopy of heaven instead of the roof of the warehouse swaggering roistering bullwhackers as the santa fe drivers were called strode up and down cracking their whips and crying to their oxen and mules in spanish french or choctaw as the case might be a busy scene indeed was the levee in the fifties but gordon found no difficulty in getting through it now the great pulsing heart seemed stricken with paralysis he went on down by the old gillis house still standing but given up to water rats it had been headquarters for the free state men in the stormy days of the border quarrel it had sheltered governor reeder when his life was sought and he escaped from it in the disguise of a woodcutter so says the chronicle he noticed as he looked idly around the name of f x aubrey and remembered the story he had heard from his father's lips of f x aubrey's mad ride from santa fe to independence a distance of eight hundred miles he smiled as he recalled it it seemed to be proof that what a man must do he can f x aubrey wagered ten thousand dollars that he could make it in six days and found takers 
he did it in five and a half then he said he could do it in four days and they bet him twenty thousand dollars he couldn't he rode into independence at the end of three days and a half they did not erect triumphal arches in those days but he had a boat named for him that was the way they sounded a great man's praises in the west business was leaving the levee before the war ten years before in fact it had outgrown these narrow limits and a few venturesome spirits had sought locations on the hills a start once made others followed and it was not long until the levee was given up to wholesale houses and shipping interests the city was creeping up the ravines which have since been named main street and market street or grand avenue as it now calls itself in the days when it was a ravine road a thoroughfare only for the santa fe trains it was content nay proud to be market street for market street had a metropolitan sound to people who picked their own wild greens and cured their own bacon and raised the corn that was to make the dumplings even in blissful hope of a market some day an avenue had not come into their wildest dreams certainly not a boulevard for they still climbed the hills from market gorge to main street ravine and thence to broadway gulch with difficulty hoping only for cross-cuts some day that would make life a little less arduous it is a pity that everybody in the country could not have had one view of this town of dogged determination when it was getting itself made it would have been a lesson to the timid builder of cities an eye-opener as to the relative importance of sight and topography strangers holding on to their breath and their scalps as they go up the steep grades of the ninth street cable or down the hair-raising descent of the viaduct leading to the union depot are wont to remark with chattering teeth that kansas city is rather hilly but to the old settler who remembers it in the days of its youthful angularities it seems now like a tennis court for smoothness in eighteen sixty three when gordon lay was restlessly threading its hollows and climbing its heights the dwellings looked down a distance of thirty or forty feet into their neighbor's chimneys the neighbor having decided to conform to the grade from these eyries one descended at imminent risk of life and limb but people who wanted to be permanent must perforce meet the grade and people who were transient of course wouldn't so there were a good many left high up in the world then if never before an enterprising young man visited this ragged city at the close of the war i went to stay he said thirty years afterward with money in my pocket to invest well i took a look around and decided it could not be done but it was if i had put my money into those hills and sat down and done nothing for the rest of my life i should have been better off in this world's goods than i am to-day after a life of hard work it would have been a good time for a young man like gordon lay to have been thinking of investments but he was not doing it he had caught sight of a squad of mounted men guarding the stage-coach he quickened his steps the mail was in he lounged around until it was open saying to himself that he knew there wouldn't be one so as to lessen his disappointment when it did not come but the letter came there were two of them he was not surprised at this for he had written one to virginia one to her father they were thick and promising looking and both in virginia's writing he could not wait he stopped under a tree on his way to the barracks nobody was looking and he kissed the name her hand had penned then he tore it open he looked at the thing that fell out with eyes that refused to comprehend mechanically he tore open the other it was like it they were his own unopened letters End of chapter thirty nine chapter forty of order number eleven this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org order number eleven by caroline abbott stanley chapter forty the old order changeth when the trevilians reached jefferson city they did what hundreds of refugees from the depopulated counties were doing in different parts of the state they went first to the home of friends whose hearts were big enough to take them in with all their poverty and wretchedness the one gleam of sunlight on this dark page was the infinite depths of human sympathy it brought to light the people of missouri were sore pressed in sixty three business was paralyzed money was hard to get death was rampant and taxes went on but when the fleeing refugees came thrust out by powerful pitiless hands they took them in and ministered to them 
old furniture long disabled was mended up and put into empty hands the children were huddled closer together that the surplus bedding might go to cover shivering little ones storerooms were ransacked to find something that could be spared for those who had nothing in many cases it was silver and gold have i none but such as i have give i thee said one of those refugees thirty years afterward holding up a battered dripping pan as she spoke this with a stove was sent to me by mrs emily henderson when i went down to fulton in sixty three a house and lot would not be to me now what that cook stove was then the good samaritan who had taken them in said to colonel trevilian a day or two after they arrived colonel i have a little old house down here it really was in poverty hollow but he didn't like to say so that doesn't bring me in anything i can't rent it i'm ashamed to offer it to you but if you could make it do till you can look around colonel trevilian grasped his hand every feature working with emotion my friend he said i shall take it as a gift from god and so in a little shack with an old rag carpet given by one a cord bedstead and a trundle bed by another with such odds and ends as the good samaritan's wife could collect the trevilians began again in poverty hollow it was much in those days to have temporary relief but when they were housed and fed and clothed and the oil of consolation poured into bruised hearts there was always the pressing imminent question of maintenance they were comfortable now but what should they eat and what should they drink and wherewithal should they be clothed to-morrow colonel trevilian asked himself this question with agonizing iteration as he walked the streets of the capital city he was just the kind of man to shrink from either debt or dependence and yet the owner of thousands of acres of the richest land in the state he was penniless what they would have done without the cow nobody knows but the cow rose to the occasion people can live a long time on milk then a grocer was found who did not have a cow and a washerwoman who could not sew and a system of barter sprang up it isn't as if we really worked for money said miss nanny to virginia we've always done their sewing while they did our washing of course assented virginia tearing off the widths of aunt sylvie's new dress she was wondering how she could get some shoes aunt sylvie precipitated the economic question that was bound to be settled some time miss nanny i'm monsus proud of dat frock you all made me i showed it to old woman judy and now she say ain't you gwine to make her one i told her you made mine fur de washin and she low she got some mighty fine chickens she'd give you fur de makin of a dress miss nanny raised the cover of a box before she answered and looked in there was a little piece of middling there nothing else and mrs trevilian was sick and had been wishing that very morning for chicken soup she turned to aunt sylvie tell her to bring the dress over she said i'll make it she told virginia about it that night don't tell your father she said you know how he feels about women working they had to tell mrs trevilian they had been doing this kind of surreptitious work for months when one day a mulatto woman arrayed and tagged out finery that presented a striking contrast to the comfortable plaid lindsays of a few years ago knocked at the front door miss nanny was alone she had seen the woman from the window she replied to the knock before it ended go around to the back door she said without circumlocution her eyes flashing the woman hesitated made a face at the closed door and obeyed when she came in she stood transfixed laws a mercy ef it ain't miss nanny trevilian she exclaimed miss nanny looked up quietly from her sewing howdy tildy you are mrs pascoe's tildy ain't you the woman threw herself sprawling into the only rocking chair the room held no'm she said bridling i ain't nobody's tildy i belongs to myself now ain't you heerd about de proclamation the proclamation repeated miss nanny dryly yes i believe i have i'm miss maud hubbard now said the girl with a simper i don't go by the name er tildy no mo i done tuck de name er hubbard miss maud hubbard for some reason miss nanny who was kindness and consideration itself to aunt sylvia and aunt judy and the rest of the white turban tribe was not responsive to miss maud hubbard 
the woman rocked herself back and forth eyeing the silent seamstress with evident satisfaction how did you know we were here asked miss nanny one of de colored ladies told me dey was a white woman over here dat took in so em but i never spicioned it was you miss nanny i never spected to see de day when you'd be so em fur de colored people i don't know why said miss nanny i've sewed for them all my life but you ain't done it for pay returned the girl striking with unerring instinct at the sorest spot dat's what i'm maritin about you doin of it for pay miss nanny was speechless with rage tildy was looking critically around the bare room looks like you was seein mighty hard times miss nanny where's all yo things gone to kansas said miss nanny grimly to kansas what fur to help put down the rebellion what'd you say miss nanny i said the kansas soldiers took them the same that took you i reckon ah oh, she lapsed into silence looking through the open door into the other room and taking in with pleasure all its poverty and bareness de war's made a heap er changes she remarked complacently she was misled by miss nanny's impassive manner what do you want miss nanny asked abruptly she felt her patience giving way the woman turned to her bundle is you ever made any party dresses miss nanny yes she was thinking of the last one she had had it was of lavender silk and she had made it to wear to tom caldwell's inn fair out on the prairie it seemed a thousand years since then well i want to get you to make one for me she was unrolling the bundle as she spoke and laying it in miss nanny's lap but she was not quite ready yet for the details of business yassum de war sholy has made a heap er changes she repeated reflectively i certainly never spected to see de time when miss nanny trevilian would be makin a ball dress for a colored lady for pay you haven't seen it yet said miss nanny you haven't got money enough to oh i gwine to pay you the girl said with a toss of her head i got plenty er money is virginia workin too you impudent black hussy cried miss nanny hurling the words at her as if they were missiles get out of here if you ever set foot on this place again i'll set the dogs on you she had forgotten that the dogs too were gone miss maud hubbard shot through the door with one agile bound her effects in the shape of a shower of pink tarlatan and linings and spools and ribbons followed her to be picked up later then miss nanny slammed the door and dropped in a passion of humiliated tears on the trundle bed virginia found her thus a half hour later oh verge verge she cried hysterically i've killed the goose that laid the golden egg why aunt nan what in the world have you done done i've called a nigger an impudent black hussy and i ought to have called her a colored lady when she had made her explanation virginia looked sober i'm afraid our business is done for aunt nan but she drew a long breath it was worth it that night she sewed up her shoes once more and put in an extra layer of pasteboard of all these business complications colonel trevilian knew nothing there's no use telling him miss nanny had said and his wife and daughter agreed with her no it would humiliate him beyond measure to know that the women on the place are at work and he is not said mrs trevilian you know how he has always felt about your doing anything nan that is anything except about the house i know said his sister with a half sob but mercy sister betty people's ways have got to change now and their notions too they lived in daily hourly hope of his finding something to do he was familiar with legislative work he had been representative more than once and he had been a first-class farmer but it is hard to find work in middle life especially when all the old traditions and methods and institutions are tottering around one colonel trevilian as the days went by walked in a dazed way through the new order of things there were government offices but they were naturally not for one who was a southern sympathizer there were places enough of certain kinds but young men were the ones sought for them there were business openings too but capital was needed to make use of them there are few greater tragedies in this world than the daily struggle for existence especially for one who begins the struggle late one day when colonel trevilian had gone hopefully to try for a position only to find it filled the man said in response to a question no sir i don't really know of a thing not a single thing in this town that you would be likely to get unless 
he hesitated looked hastily at the colonel's stately form and then away i am willing to do anything honourable sir said colonel trevilian anything well said the man with some embarrassment they say they are needing men at the prison just now in what capacity sir asked the colonel eagerly as guards colonel trevilian started he had thought he was ready for anything i thank you sir he said at last with difficulty i i will consider it yes firmly i will consider it sir he lifted his hat with the grace of a courtier and walked slowly down the street stumbling a little as if he were not sure of his footing poor old fellow the man said looking after him and shaking his head that's a sad case he belongs to a past order how colonel trevilian considered it one knowing the traditions of his race and of his age could conjecture but the woodpile was nearly gone and the mercury falling he walked around to where he knew a prison gang was at work he said to himself that there would be no harm in that it would not commit him to anything certainly not he stepped rapidly until he came within sight of them then he moderated his pace and sauntered by looking at them casually in passing the guards stood gun in hand he tried to think of himself in that position no no one might better be an overseer he thought bitterly he quickened his steps he wanted to get away out of sight of the miserable wretches in their zebra coats how hideous daily association with criminals must be but it was very cold he buttoned his overcoat tight around his throat and then a minute later threw it open at the neck somehow the thing choked him and after his rapid walking he needed breath his way was straight east he was nearing the outskirts of the town and the prison lay that way at the side of the walls he stopped i don't know what i have come out here for he said to himself i certainly am not going to be a prison guard why it is monstrous monstrous but when he essayed to turn his steps he seemed drawn forward something impelled him from within it was a lonely road as he stumbled on fragments of sentences fell from his lips he did not know he was thinking aloud it is very cold and getting colder yes only three sticks then he drew himself up a guard did you say a guard his lip curled in scorn why sir she is a descendant of the cavaliers but the child needs the shoes virginia fatal name well i i will consider it it was late when he got home he came stumblingly into the room he felt very old it was hard to lift his feet what would they say had been the burden of his thoughts oh no they would say nothing but what would they think how would they feel ah but what was a man to do he asked himself looking around fiercely they were all there he had hoped to find his wife alone she took his hat and drew him to the blazing fire come and get warm mr trevilian she said cheerfully it is cold to-night she saw that something had happened he sat down and held out his hands to the blaze betty she was beside him instantly was it beverly what is it dear i have got work you have oh i am so glad where at the prison the prison she echoed yes he said with bitter cutting emphasis i go to-morrow as a guard for a moment there was dead silence it was broken by a dismayed ejaculation from miss nanny brother mrs trevilian shot a swift glance of warning at her sister-in-law not for naught did the blood of the cavaliers course through her veins if blue blood is not for emergencies like this what is it for she drew her husband's head close to her as she stood and smoothed back the iron-gray locks then she sat down by him and looked with unflinching eyes into his i'm glad very glad she said cheerfully it is not what you want but what you can get these days and you'll be a prince among guards my dear there was a ringing note of courage in her words that roused him like a clarion a look of ineffable relief stole over his face will it be hard work she asked he did not answer he did not hear her he took her hand reddened and roughened by unaccustomed toil and raised it to his lips not in the sunny days of courtship had she been so unspeakably dear to him as now a prudent wife is from the lord he said her price is far above rubies the heart of her husband doth safely trust in her she shall do him good and not evil all the days of her life amen said miss nanny inaudibly i wonder if i will ever have any sense she added to virginia in the other room 
i know sister betty is the best woman in the world End of chapter forty